so um, we've invited uh, Greg Willard back, KTRS legal analyst and all-around nice guy. Greg Willard, welcome. <laughs> Good morning, us. McGraw. You are a professor at St. Louis University Law School and um, watching the cable programs, watching an array of the cable programs, an array of the talking heads, the amount of misinformation out there and lack of knowledge <laughs> is the reason why we have gone to you to get the facts so we can then skew it towards our own opinion. <laughs> but we need to know the facts first. And the simple question is, with all the things going on in the world, there was a story that came out last week that, uh, well, Donald Trump said he's looking forward to testifying under oath to uh, Robert Mueller and the special counsel. Um, and then came word last week that his uh, lawyers are counseling him not to because they're afraid he might perjure himself, which is a whole other story. <laughs> but this is where it all breaks down into um, can he, should he, is he allowed legally, ethically, where are we in this world? Does he, if asked, doesn't he have to then go speak to Robert Mueller? No. He doesn't? No, does not. If, if he, uh, as, as you and I have done on the, the air before, let's, let's uh, choose our words carefully. Right. If he is asked to give Robert Mueller and his uh, attorneys an interview, the president is not legally, constitutionally, or otherwise required to do that. Okay. That's a different question. We can talk about it from, is he required to comply with a grand jury subpoena to testify? Okay. All right. Back up a second. Mueller asks him, he can say no. Correct. And Mueller has no recourse. Uh, well, 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 well in, in terms of asking him, he can't force him. He can't, he can't say, Mr. President, pretty please, okay. pretty, pretty please do it. If Donald Trump says yes and sits down and he's not under oath, can President Trump lie to, the, to Robert Mueller? No. It is a federal crime to make a false statement to federal investigators. It is a federal crime to commit perjury to lie under oath. If you think back a few months ago, McGraw, there have already been two convictions in the Mueller investigation, Mr. Flynn and Mr. Papadopoulos. Both of them have been convicted of federal felonies of false statements, or they have pled guilty. So they weren't necessarily under oath. They just lied to the they feds. Lied, they lied to the FBI, and uh, it's sort of an axiom. If you lie to the FBI, check the box, you are not having a good day. Okay. So uh, when they talk about Donald Trump being under oath or not being under oath, does it really matter? It does not. I think as a, as a practical matter and legal consequences matter, it it, it, it is uh, six of one, half a dozen of the other, McGraw. It is a federal crime to lie to a federal investigator. It is a federal crime to lie under oath. Both of them are felonies. Both of them have serious criminal penalties. Um, what when We keep hearing that they're talking to his attorneys, negotiating the terms. We hear that. What's there to negotiate? If he's going to come down and sit for a meeting... Can they say, okay, that's fine, but we don't want you to ask about Russia? I mean, I, that, how does that work? I think uh, with, with any interview, uh, if, if you and I or I were contacted to give an interview to an FBI agent, our attorneys may try to uh, reach an understanding as to scope. Mm -hmm. In the context of the interviewee being the President of the United States, that is not only critically important, but it's critically necessary. Because whatever one thinks of the president politically, he is the president. And the interviewers would have to be careful not to inadvertently take the conversation into some very serious national security uh, discussion points. So the fact that the president and his attorneys, or through his attorneys, that there are discussions with Mueller as to the scope of a possible interview. Mm -hmm. Not only does that not surprise me, I would be surprised if they weren't right. having those conversations. So in other words, they, they would say, look, you're not going to ask about um, the Iran deal with this, right? I mean, they're going to say, or, or they're going to say, you can only ask about Russia but between Tuesday and Thursday back in June? Or, I mean, how? how? Uh, well, I think uh, maybe a little more generic, but uh, it, it they would try to negotiate not only the categories, 
but put some fence posts around those categories, uh, All right. largely based on, on what Mueller has uh, authorized to investigate. We've seen this on Law and Order as well as uh, every single good law uh, and courtroom drama we've ever seen. When the defendant opens the door on the stand, right? It wasn't going to be admitted, but when the defendant opened the door on the stand, then they have a right. So if they agree to these facts and Donald Trump in, in his meandering answers opens a door to something, would then that agreement be off the table and then Mueller allowed to go down that rabbit hole? No. Uh, and it would be a distinction between uh, a, a rule of evidence, mm -hmm. the law and order example you gave McGraw, right. and then the scope of the uh, of the interview. So if if Area X is off limits for Mueller to, to question based upon their understanding, and the president makes a comment that, that spills over into X, right. that would not void the okay. agreement to limit it to X. All right. Now, uh, so let's assume, for argument's sake, Donald Trump is asked, he takes the advice of his lawyers, and he says, no, I'm not going to go and sit down with you. I don't like you. I don't have time for you. What's the next step for Robert Mueller? The next step for Mueller is uh, to make a calculation. It, it happens, uh, it, it's happening across the country today, uh, McGraw with federal prosecutors, uh, where a witness says, I'm not going to cooperate. And the, what the, uh, Mr. Mueller and his colleagues have to decide is this. Is President Trump's testimony, his interview, so material to our investigation that we cannot get this information any other way. Mm -hmm. And if the answer uh, to that is no, then the president probably will avoid having to discuss this right. uh, so with federal investigators. They'll pass. If the answer is yes, then as with Bill Clinton, you'll remember, uh, President Trump will get a subpoena to testify before a grand jury in Washington, D.C., as President Clinton did. So President Clinton was under subpoena when he went and met with Ken Starr. Correct. Uh, he, he testified, uh, you may recall, it was, it was broadcast. He, uh, he gave his grand jury testimony from the White House. Right. The grand jurors were back at the federal courthouse up okay. on Pennsylvania Avenue. Right. They watched it on a live video feed, but President Clinton gave grand jury testimony. So if President Trump decides that he is not going to voluntarily be interviewed, right. if Mr. Mueller says, I have to have his information, mm -hmm. Mueller will serve him with a subpoena. Now, the president may say, I'm not going to comply with the subpoena. My that's next, un my, that's my, unconstitutional. My next question, what happens if the president says, I'm not going, I know I have this subpoena, I'm not going to go and honor it? I think uh, you and I would go back to our high school civics books. We would dust off uh, the 1974 Supreme Court case, U.S. v. Nixon, and say, I don't think I'm going to bet on President Trump's chances because there. Because that said what? What did that say? What the, what the Supreme Court said in U.S. v. Nixon was that President Nixon could not ignore a federal court subpoena to turn over the tapes that in the context of a criminal prosecution, the court said, Mr. President, you have to turn over the tapes. So applying that, if in your, the hypothetical, if President Trump says, I'm not going to comply mm -hmm. with a federal grand jury subpoena to testify, uh, then uh, the, the uh, court fight would begin and a court would have to decide whether as a constitutional matter he has that right or whether um, the uh, precedent in U.S. v. Nixon applies. W would that take years, months, days? Oh, my goodness, McGraw. It would, uh, let's, I guess we could put a couple of markers down. It would be significant delay, but I think it would be measured in months, not weeks, and months, not years. Okay. I think that we've talked about this on the air in a different context, but I think it's important just to yeah. remind our listeners and viewers this morning. In U.S. v. Nixon, there was a footnote, footnote eight, and it said the special prosecutor had the power to subpoena the president under a Justice Department regulation and basically backhanded Nixon's constitutional argument. 
you, you hear from the president, President Trump supporters that, well, th this is a witch hunt and Mueller can't force the president to testify. Uh, he, he constitutionally can't do that. I would remind those supporters, go read footnote eight to U.S. v. Nixon and you probably won't be arguing as strenuously that Mueller does not have the constitutional authority. So footnote authority. eight says what? Just that footnote eight says that said that that the special prosecutor in Nixon had the constitutional authority to subpoena the president. Oh, I see. Mueller is an independent counsel under a different Department of Justice regulation. And what U.S. v. Nixon says is, as long as the regulation that the prosecutor, or in this case, special counsel, as long as it's in effect, right. the footnote said it is binding on the president. Hmm. Okay. Uh, what was that Nixon versus U.S.? What was that vote? U.S. v. Nixon was 8 to 0 in the Supreme Court. Uh, then Justice Rehnquist recused himself. And didn't he say later that he would have voted in favor of, of the others and he, it would have been he, 9 to 0? He basically he said basically as much. It would have been 9 to 0. Yeah. But it was, a, it was a unanimous decision. So it was 8 Chief. to it was no. It wasn't even close. Oh, it wasn't. No, no, no. It was, uh, it was 8 to 0. You, no dissents. Right. Uh, in, in mm -hmm. Written by Chief Justice Berger. Okay. So now um, um, go back to... Um, Bill Clinton, because what was the law or what was the ruling that said that Bill Clinton can't be called for to to be sued for things that happened while he was in office, only things before he he came into office? <clears throat> there was a, it went all the way to Supreme Court. You'll recall that Paula Jones, a former Arkansas State employee, right. uh, uh, sued the president in a civil suit. Okay for uh, sexual harassment. Imagine that in, in this day and age. <laughs> um, and he, and sued him down in federal court in Arkansas. Uh -huh. He took the position that as the sitting president, he could not be sued uh, un until such time as he left office. It was appealed to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals here in St. Louis, and then it went to the United States Supreme Court. And the United States Supreme Court ruled in Clinton versus Jones is the name of the case is that a president could be sued civilly while he is a sitting president. And the court said it's up to the trial court to give great deference to the president in terms of scheduling. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that ruling, Clinton had to sit down and have his deposition taken in that case, which then led to the perjury allegations which led to his grand jury testimony, which led to the impeachment. But all of that, McGraw, came right. out of a civil lawsuit. Because, now, this is important, because he allegedly perjured himself in the civil deposition. Yes. Which then got Ken Starr involved in the criminal side, and that's then ultimately had him. So even though he, so he committed a crime. Allegedly. Allegedly, while he was in office. Mm -hmm. Which is what they were investigating. Which was the which led to the impeachment. Gotcha. So, so the the allegation was he lied in his is his civil deposition. Mm -hmm. That then uh, and then there were other uh, obstruction of justice allegations and all, and that burbled up to him being required to testify before the grand jury. And there was allegations that he lied before the grand jury. Right. That all burbled up and ended up in the impeachment in the House and then the trial in the Senate. Superimpose all of that onto this situation because Donald Trump was candidate Trump, citizen Trump. He was candidate Trump. He was president-elect Trump, and he's president Trump. So where does all of that ruling superimpose over all of Donald Trump's varying degrees? I think that ruling superimposed, I think you're seeing it in action right now, is that n no one, no one, even uh, the, the most ardent proponents and supporters of the president, no one is arguing that somehow he's immune from any of this because he's the president. Gotcha. So no, no one's arguing. Well, isn't like, um, aren't some people saying that there's a... Uh, conflict of uh, uh, separation of powers, and he can't sit in front of this. Well, and... that's the footnote eight. A good point, McGraw, is that there are people saying, wait a second, under our Constitution, the executive power is invested in one person, the president. And if the president, who is the chief law enforcement officer, the chief prosecutor, says, Mr. Mueller, 
you need to stop your investigation, the proponents of that position would say, well, that's, that's the Constitution. The, the president is the executive. And that's why footnote eight in U.S. v. Nixon is so important because the Supreme Court has said eight to zero. As long as there is a regulation mm -hmm. that gives that discretion to a third party, in this case, Mueller, back then Jaworski, quote, the president is bound to follow it. OK, so just 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 um, just so I understand, if I'm asked to argue this on Fox or MSNBC <laughs> or CNN and somebody chimes in, hey, there needs to be a separation of powers. I can say, no, 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 no. Nixon v. U.S. v. Nixon. Go look at footnote eight, Joker. Right. And I will sound and like a you genius. Will be, you will be a regular legal be. <laughs> analyst on, on Fox and Friends, my friend. And I don't even need a law degree for that. You don't need a law degree. But, <laughs> but it is important. And I guess the other thing I'd point out, McGraw, is that you hear this mantra um, from uh, supporters of the president. There was no collusion. Right. Just, I mean, it's just right. an Ipsy Dixit. Because we say it, it is true. And I would... And, and I, you and I never take sides on the air, and I'm not going to take sides in that debate this morning, but I would, I would simply um, point out that the two guilty pleas by Flynn and Papadopoulos mm -hmm. relate to their involvement as advisors to the Trump campaign with the Russians. Right. So there's a lot of smoke, is what you're saying. There is a, a lot of smoke, and right. whether whether his political opponents uh, are going to be able to clear the smoke and find a crime, right? Or uh, otherwise, we we need to wait and see. But uh, as I've said on the air, if anybody's going to find the answers, Robert Mueller will do it. If he refuses to be interviewed, if he gets subpoenaed, and he refuses to honor the subpoena. I mean, are then we looking at a constitutional crisis? Not at that point, because what will happen then is it will be litigated in the court. So the federal district court in Washington will attempt to enforce the subpoena, and there will be uh, a hearing, and there will be a decision, and then it will probably go to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court then will decide. Now that's back to our months of delay. Right. If the Supreme Court says, yes, Mr. President, you must testify. Right. And then he says no. Right. Or the analogy, Nixon said, I don't care it was 8 to 0. I'm not giving you the tapes. Then, McGraw, we have a constitutional crisis. But merely because... Did Nixon say that? No, Nixon... No, no, he no. turned it over. He said, he said 8 to nothing, here are, here are the tapes. Here are the tapes. But the, I think the, the constitutional crisis would be triggered if there is an adjudication by a court, or specifically the Supreme Court, right. and the president says, nah, I'm a co-equal branch, I'm not going to comply with your ruling, U.S. Supreme Court. Then, then everyone, then, then is a steering match. Then uh, buy some extra paper in the United States House of Representatives because the bills of impeachment will be flying. Um, all right. Stay tuned. Anything, <laughs> anything else I didn't ask you that is of, por of importance? Well, I... I to keep our history lesson hat on, yes. <clears throat> how how uh, how things have changed, my friend. In uh, the fall of 1974, yes, there was a similar hue and cry against the president, and he's a crook. And there's a hidden deal right. that Gerald Ford and Richard Nixon worked out on the pardon. Right, and it was it was just this pounding that, well, that's a secret deal, and, and Ford agreed to give him a pardon ahead of time so that he could become president. Right. No request for an interview, no grand jury subpoenas, no litigation in the Supreme Court. Do you remember what Gerald Ford did? He called up his friend Bill Hungate from Troy, Missouri, who was <clears throat> chairman of the House Judiciary Subcommittee, and said, Bill, I want to voluntarily come to Congress, sit down in an open hearing, and answer all of your questions so that we can clear the air. And in October of 1974, President Gerald Ford went to Capitol Hill voluntarily, sat there for several hours, and asked every question, and guess what happened? It you went. didn't hear a lot of talk after that wow, about I didn't a hidden know deal. that. Absolutely. Voluntarily testified. So, under oath. So after, under oath to Congress, and the argument, was, and they were trying to get to the bottom of, was there a was, special was deal? There a deal? Was there a deal on the pardon? And, and wow. uh, you, you can go back and, and look at well, the... Well, the reason why we don't hear about it today is because all the questions were answered. All the questions were answered. You had, you had, the, you had Elizabeth Holtzman 
Barbara Jordan. I mean, you had some pretty, uh, pretty uh, strident uh, political opponents, at right. least. And they and he sat there for several hours uh, and answered questions under oath. Wow. Now, I'm not suggesting that Donald Trump uh, uh, go uh, go up to Capitol Hill, but I, I, I think it's just fascinating, McGraw, no, that's to a, look back on yeah. history uh, where we've had similar very significant national controversies and how different presidents yeah. dealt with it. Footnote number eight. Footnote number eight, U.S. v. Nixon. There you go. <laughs> uh, that is worthy of at least two uh, credits towards your law degree at St. Louis University Law School. Uh, Greg Willard, KTRS Legal Analyst, uh, a resource that we are thrilled to have because you are the best. Thank you, sir. Great to be with you, my friend. 929.